Uh, my name is Luke Smith. I'm uh, one of the members of the YUI team, and I'm going to be talking about the event system in YUI 3 today and how it's evolved over time to the greatness that it is today that we'll soon all know and love. So we'll start with a little bit of history. Uh, this, as you're well familiar with, is the back in the day, in the original, it was always the DOM, and this is how we interacted with it. And then we learned that that was actually kind of dumb. So we introduced the separation of concerns. We started separating the markup from the, the JavaScript, and we're hooking into events inside of the JavaScript, leaving the markup for, um, just for the content, right? So this was actually inadequate as well, especially in an environment where you have some collaboration. You only have that one event listener going on in this object, so that's not going to cut it either. So the, the W3C comes along, and they say, hey, guys, I've got the greatest solution for you. We'll take care of that collaboration problem. You just use this convenient 16-character method name, and all of your you know, yeah, multiple subscription things taken care of, right? And of course, that doesn't work either because we have legacy browsers, and IE has a different API, and it just doesn't work, right? So we end up with something like this. We can check to see if it has the right API. Maybe it has the IE API, or maybe it uh, doesn't have either, and we end up doing that, which, of course, is also done. So that's not going to cut it. <clears throat> so we move on to trying to wrap up the best practices for event subscription into just a method name called maybe add event. There are a few different versions of this going around on the web a few years ago. And handle all of that normalization under the hood and just sort of rely on, uh, on sort of viral spreading of the word to say this is how you should do it. Everyone just cut and paste this code into your site and your event subscriptions will be taken care of just right, right? This is also incomplete, unfortunately, because it's only part of the problem. It does take care of event subscriptions for the most part, um, but it's still missing something, right? You've got the event object on the inside of that event handler, and it also has normalization issues, right? So this is kind of the beginning of uh, where the libraries come from. The JavaScript libraries sort of originate from this point, where we realize that there are a lot of things that need to be normalized. The event system in particular is really mucked up across the browsers, but there are other things out there as well, like the DOM utility and uh, just other nifty things that we can do on top of a normalized platform and make it easier for developers. So we have uh, in YUI2, one of those libraries, we have the event utility, which has the on method for subscribing and the prevent default method for uh, handling the, the interaction with the event objects themselves. So we have a normalized subscription model, and we have a normalized event handling, and we have DOM-like method names. So the DOM-like method names is really important, and it, from a philosophical standpoint, we feel very strongly that um, the API that we present to you should be reminiscent of the actual system that you're working with under the hood. This is the DOM people. So we want to name things as it would be in a DOM system if it worked, right? So in YUI 3, we sort of realized that the problem is really kind of the starting point. The starting point of, of your subscription is that you have this DOM element in hand that is just a bundle of volatility, right? You don't know what DOM it's coming from because you could be rendered in this browser or that browser and all of that. And so you're passing this, this little bundle of volatility into some utility function which is supposed to take care of everything under the hood. Now, it's, it's fine. It takes care of it all right. But uh, having that unstable thing as your core starting point is just sort of an invitation to disaster. So in YUI 3, one of the big evolutions we did was in the, in the node interface and uh, pro uh, providing that node facade over the actual DOM to give you a new starting point where all you have to do is treat the node instances as if you were working with the DOM and it works, right? So in this case, we end up giving you the normalized subscription and the normalized event handling like before and the DOM-like method names because everything is hung directly on the node instance. Now we have DOM-like context too, right? So if you were working in raw DOM, you would be executing these methods on the thing that you wanted to subscribe to, right? So now in YUI 3, 
you get to. Right? So it's now even more reminiscent of the underlying subsystem. And of course, it's an awful lot shorter. I mean, it's a really long utility method, so mm, let's, let's work on that. So yeah, we give you the DOM now, but it works. Right? That's what we want to do. <coughs> so that's really just the beginning of the story, because the big revolution happened with YUI2 introducing custom events into the system. Now, custom events are awesome. Right? Hopefully, everyone here already agrees with that. But what they did for us was that they allowed us to create an event-driven architecture on top of an event-driven architecture, right? We're working in a system that's event-driven, right? This is the DOM. The DOM works with events. So if we give you the capacity to build a system that works with events, then it goes with the grain of the system that you're actually working with. Everything is DOM-driven, or everything is event-driven at the end of the day. So um, YUI2, we, we like the DOM. We like the, the notion of having an event-driven system. And so we create these custom events. And this is how it looks in its early days. And we instantiate a, a custom event and drop that on your object as just a property in your object. And the API for subscribing to those custom events lives on that object. So eventually that evolved into the event provider API, which you'll see in the uh, more recent widgets in YUI2. And that, what that gives, it brings the API onto the instance itself. And so you have this hosting mechanism on the instance that says, I have you know, X, Y, and Z events. You can just subscribe to it with a string, just like you would do in, in uh, DOM methods, saying add event listener event name as a string. Right? So that follows that same pattern. And then internally, you can fire the event uh, to trigger all of the, the listeners and to send out that notification, broadcast that notification to your subscribers. So in YUI3, we like that pattern. We stuck with that pattern, but we're bringing everything in. We're uh, shortening method names, and we're trying to do a lot more normalization here. Uh, there's also this, uh, the publish step. I didn't mention on the previous slide that another thing that uh, was nice about the event provider API in YUI2 is that you don't have to create those custom events anymore. You can just fire them, and if someone's subscribing to it, then they'll receive a notification. So we, we also took care of that. We, we also brought that into YUI3 as well, so you don't have to publish the events, and publish is the API that you use in YUI3. So <clears throat> there's an awful lot of cool stuff happening in each of these steps here, and we'll get to that in, in time, but let's start by getting this API onto your classes. So what you want to do is you want to extend event target or extend your class with event target. Event target is the bare bones event API. This is where it all lives. Node instances, they're all event target, right? All of the rest of the things that we hand you that have events, they're all event target. However, most of them are actually base-based. So if you extend base, it also gives you the event API because it, it itself extends uh, event target. But it also gives you managed attributes and the ability to, to add plugins onto whatever you're uh, adding plugins onto your class. Uh, Satyan is going to talk about that later this afternoon. Highly recommend going to his presentation. It's going to be awesome. Um, and finally, widget, which also gives you the UI lifecycle. So all of these things have that same underlying event API. So everything operates the same way. I'm going to go ahead and recommend that, in general, use base. Extend base. It's really done a great job of being proven to be stable. And uh, it boils in the best practices. And it affords, uh, it just has a lot of great stuff in it that you can uh, take advantage of and you should take advantage of when building your modules and applications. So let's talk about the normalized subscription again. So now we have the DOM events and the custom events. They're both using the same method name, right? So we're taking this concept of event and saying it doesn't matter if it's a DOM event. It doesn't matter if it's a custom event. The API for dealing with them both is the same. So it's now a unified subscription API allowing you to deal consistently with just the event API 
in the same way across your application, and it doesn't matter where it's coming from. So jumping back into YY2, um, when we were offering up the custom events, when we first created the custom events, we liked the, the notion of the observer pattern, right? There was, you have something that hosts a series of events, and when it comes to that interesting moment, it broadcasts those events. People can subscribe to it, they get notified. It's your basic observer pattern. But the DOM actually has more going on there. And so we like the DOM, and we decided that uh, we want to be more DOM-like. But we also wanted to take the opportunity to go a bit above and beyond what the DOM offers and give some really nice, cool things or some things that you've always wanted. Maybe you didn't realize you've always wanted, but you probably did. And so since we have the ability to do that for you, we put, uh, we put some of that into YUI3 as well. So making the custom events more DOM-like, these are the two core things that are necessary to bring the custom event infrastructure from YUI2 up to a more DOM-like API. We have default behaviors and event bubbling. Eric talked a little bit about this in, um, in his intro presentation. Uh, I'll go into a little more detail about that now. So default behaviors, right? So you push on a, on a key, and the default function is to add that letter into your text input, right? You can cancel that behavior. The event still fires, and it becomes your hook to say, uh, I choose, I get to choose whether or not this bit of functionality executes. We've taken care of the API for subscribing to things. The default behaviors and the bubbling are going to be some configuration that we do in the publish step. And we uh, talked about that a little bit earlier. So we're going to start with the default behaviors. And in particular, in the publish step here, the configuration that you pass on to, uh, pass into publish when you're publishing your event name. This is a, a really simple example. Yeah, if you're extending base, then you have an initializer function. And this is the proper place to do things like setting up events that have some default functionality or have some special thing going on inside of them. So in here, the configuration object is passed into publish, and you specify a default function. In this case, it's just pointing to a, an internal method called this .default, uh, default start function. This is just a naming convention that we've taken up internally. Uh, it, does, it isn't necessarily terribly readable at first glance, but over time, it does make it easier for maintainability, because if you see this code, or if you see this function name in your code, you know that this function is related to an event. It's a default function for a particular event. And you can look for a publish, or it informs you that this function has something to do with the event infrastructure that I'm building into my code. So let's take a look at that. So the default function is where you might, is where it's appropriate to do sort of state changes and a variety of other things. And we'll go into a little bit more dissection between what is appropriate to put where. But notice that the, the default function also receives this event object. So the event object is the same type of event object that you'll get in DOM events, right? So the thing that has the prevent default, stop propagation, all of that normalized API. Now, of course, in your default function, it doesn't really matter to have the prevent default because you're already there. So it's really useful for the payload that it brings, right? So here you'll notice that we have e.time and e.urgency. These are specific things that are hung on that event object because the event was fired internally passing in that payload. So the payload that you can pass in, the payload that you pass in at fire gets munged onto that event object so that when you're dealing with DOM events, you're dealing with e.some property of the event. When you're dealing with custom events, you're dealing with e dot some property of the event. Again, normalized approach, uh, unifying the API. So let's talk a, a little bit about what goes on step by step here. So we have an instance, some implementation code that uh, it has an instance of something that has a start event. So I'm going to subscribe to that using the on method. 
say, I'd do something when the start event happens, and then internally inside of that instance, it reaches that interesting moment and fires the event. So what happens is it executes the subscribers, it checks to see if it was prevented, and if it was prevented, then it just stops. It doesn't execute your prevented uh, your uh, default function. Otherwise, it executes your default function, and then so that's very it, that should be kind of a no-brainer. That's how the DOM works, and now that's how the YUI3 custom events work as well. So the behavior is also preventable, like I've been mentioning, and it's preventable with the same API. So we have the uh, E there, which is the event object. It has the payload hanging on it. And, uh, and you can choose to prevent default, which means that your uh, default start function is what I called it. It doesn't execute at all. You don't have to let your events be preventable. It makes sense to put code into default functions. But sometimes it doesn't make sense to have that default behavior be preventable. In the case of maybe setting up some, uh, some initial state or doing a fair amount of work, kind of an upfront building up your foundation of something. It's an interesting moment. And you want to broadcast that I am doing something that is you know, potentially really interesting. I'm setting up this foundation work. And so you want to broadcast that event. But you don't want to let people stop it, right? Um, one thing that I didn't actually mention on previous slides was that because that E object in your default function is the same E object that was in that is passed into your subscribers, your subscribers can take you know E dot urgency for example and change its value and not prevent default and then just let it go on up to the default function and at that point inside of the default function you have a new value hanging on that, that E. And so it allows you a nice hook point to uh, modify the behavior before it gets to what you think is a reasonable course of action, but you just wanted to tweak the behavior a little bit on the way. So back to the preventable thing. You can tell it not to be preventable. Or another approach is to pass into the configuration the prevented function property. And this is a function that uh, will execute if someone calls uh, eat up prevent default. So in the case that you have some setup going on that maybe there's a series of state changes and they're, they're highly event driven, but someone calls a prevent default somewhere along the lines, it'll, this function allows you to take stock of where you are right now and maybe correct your state to some place that isn't sort of in the middle of a process. right? So yeah, we like hooks. And so the default function it is actually used all over the place in YUI3. I mean, we really love it. And every time, well, I use it a lot, I guess I should say. And so do the rest of us. So we use it. Here it is in cache. It's in console. And data source uses it in a really interesting and creative way. We might end up moving more towards uh, this pattern as well. Um, drag and drop definitely uses it. You can also see that it's using setting the bubbles true configuration. We'll get into that a little bit more. Slider. And here's, a, here's an interesting uh, API, kind of a sugar API for publishing multiple events that have some special configuration rather than just calling publish, 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 publish. You can just pass an object literal to publish and take care of all of those in one go. So yeah, we love default behaviors, and you should too. So we've taken care of the unifying the subscription API and the default behaviors, so let's talk about the bubbling. And that, as you saw in one of the previous slides, that's really just as simple as in your published step, setting bubbles to true, right? Now when I first heard that YUI3 custom events were going to start bubbling, my initial impression was, that's awesome. That is so totally awesome. And then a few minutes later, I thought, it, what does that even mean? I mean, really? You have a custom event, it's, and it's bubbling? I mean, where's it bubbling to? What are you going to use it for anyway? I mean, how do you set up the infrastructure and the intelligence in the system to know where to go, right? So <clears throat> that's a really hard problem to solve. 
And it's really implementation specific, so what we do is we leave it up to you and we say, add the target. So I, as a class, when I am instantiated, I have, you know, here I am as an instance, I'm going to say um, all of my events are also going to be broadcast on here. I identify my bubble chain. So, and you can do multiple add targets if you want to create a, a, a higher chain. And actually, you'll notice that that's a public method. If you want to, if you have some object in hand, you can add yourself as a target, right? And, uh, just to be clear, adding yourself as a target is not equivalent to subscribing to all of the events that come through it. What it means is that you will also broadcast the events from the things that are bubbling up to you. You still have to have, there's still a subscription step involved in actually being notified of those events, being fired. But now you can actually subscribe to it on yourself or uh, from one of the other parts on the bubble chain. Another, possible, uh, another configuration for uh, a bubbling environment is broadcast. And broadcast is a little bit different. It's basically a convenience method for saying bubble to the Y instance. Uh, but I believe it's true that uh, broadcast events, you can't prevent default in the bubble. When you're up at the Y instance, you don't have the same control over the event. It's just sort of letting people know at an upper level that, uh, at the Y instance in particular, that all of the instances of this particular thing are going to notify the Y instance that this event happened. Um, broadcast also takes... Uh, a number two, which is a, a way to indicate that it should bubble through my Y instance and then also through a shared event target called Y.global, and we'll see that in just a second. But this Y.global is a shared event target across all YUI instances in the system. So here's the, the equivalent to the default function and the prevent, prevented function, if someone calls uh, stop propagation, then your stopped function is going to execute. So let's get into the why. This should be fairly self-explanatory, but the same concept of event delegation in the DOM applies to event delegation in the custom event world now that we're here. So if we, have, if we want to subscribe to all of the LIs, then you can set up six subscribers, or you can subscribe to just the, just the UL, and the events will bubble up to the UL. In this case, you'll actually have to do some intelligence inside of the say hi method to see, to, to verify that the method that you, or I'm sorry, to verify that the element that you're, that you're receiving the event from is actually of interest to you. And that's where um, the delegate method, the little sugar method comes in. This is kind of an aside, because delegate is really awesome. So it, it gives you that uh, gives you the control to say anything matching the selector, which is passed as the last parameter there. That's the criteria for saying this is the node that I'm interested in. Uh, but event delegation is good, and so we run into a similar circumstance where if we have a class that's going to be instantiated an awful lot in our system, then we end up with an awful lot of subscriptions if we want to know when this particular event is happening on any of them. And so uh, having the event delegation, the bubbling system, allows you to subscribe at a higher level, the manager level, uh, to be notified of any event coming from any of those instances. Same basic rule, same basic principle as event delegation in the DOM system. So here I have highlighted uh, what we call the event prefix. and what this, uh, the, the event prefix exists because this is a, an event system that we're letting you build. And, you know, we're building it ourselves, but also this is out in the world. You're creating your own events. And so if those events are bubbling, then we have to worry about name collision, right? So in order to identify the origin of this particular start event, we give it a prefix. And uh, the prefix is part of the configuration, part of the normal configuration of a base-based element. So if you extend base, then you can specify the name, and that just gets boiled in as your prefix automatically. 
Otherwise, you can actually pass the prefix in your publish step. But just use base. It's great. Um, so in this case, here you might have an initializer that says uh, add target and pulls the attribute host and say just whoever is hosting me, I'm going to bubble my events to. So this is our poster boy. Right? So drag and drop uh, is uh, really popular. And we can create a drag instance, a simple drag instance, and we can subscribe to its start event. Or there's the the DD manager, the DDM class, which affords you the uh, the higher level point to subscribe to any start event happening, any drag start event happening from any of the drag instances that you have created inside of that YUI instance. So I mentioned YUI global earlier. Uh, YUI log is an example that currently uses it. You can set up your own events to uh, to broadcast up to the y.global if you want. Uh, it kind of depends on the, the needs of your particular setup. Generally speaking, you know, it, you shouldn't need to have more than one YUI instance. And so having that YUI, uh, y.global as a bridge between instances might not be terribly necessary. But the YUI log, for example, is broadcast up to the global. And so from any number of YUI instances, you can subscribe at the global level to receive all of the log messages that are coming in from every instance on the page. Uh, right, so I think we've taken care of making them more DOM-like. So now let's make them better. So <laughs> you want to subscribe to an event, and uh, you want to override its, its execution context. So in the, in the DOM world, you have a button that you want to click on, uh, and you want to execute this function, but you don't want it to execute from the, from the context of the button itself, right? which is the default context for, for DOM events is the origin, the originating, the host of that event, right? so the node itself. Uh, this was all present in YUI 2, and of course it's, it's uh, present in YUI 3. So passing a subscription payload as well, maybe you have some transactional data or some short-lived data, it just doesn't need to exist for very long. It's really only relevant to this particular subscription, and you want to pass it in to the subscriber so that when that event is fired, your handler will receive that extra information. Um, <clears throat> detaching events has kind of been a nuisance in the past, and so we want to make that easier. And there are a couple different ways to do that. Um, after-moment subscriptions are huge. They don't seem huge because it's just there, but they're really awesome, and uh, we'll get onto that in just a second. And then while we're talking about awesome stuff, we can create new DOM events. And uh, I have an example of that at the end that should be a little bit of fun. But this, is, this gives us an opportunity to fill in the gaps in the DOM implementations uh, DOM implementation for things that really just ought to be there, and events that are relevant for working with nodes. So let's start with uh, making on a little bit better. So we have our instance we want to subscribe to its start event, and we have a function that lives on this instance of something called my object, and there it has a method called start handler. And if I just did this, then because of the way JavaScript works, start handler is going to be resolved into a function reference and then assigned into that, uh, assigned into that subscription. But when it gets executed, it doesn't know that it came from my object. It's just a function reference. And by default, this is going to refer to the window object, the global object. And that's not generally something that you want. And so you can get around that by using the y.bind method, which is a great method for locking in a context on a particular function. And what y.bind does is it returns a, a function that you can call, which just wraps up the execution of your function from the specified context. Um, but on actually has that functionality boiled into it now. So 
you can just specify a context as the third parameter, and that will override the context. You don't have to do any y.bind stuff. It'll just execute from the context. And of course, since we have the normalized API, nodes are event targets, uh, base is event target, all of the stuff that you're going to build with this API are event target, this also works on the DOM. So let's add some transactional information, some payload information to the subscription. Uh, in this case, we just can't really do it unless we maybe create uh, a, just an anonymous function right here in line that has that payload information inside of that anonymous function that is executing uh, myobject.starthandler specifically with that, that payload information. So in this case, we give you uh, y.rbind. Now y.bind also does this, but for DOM event subscription where you want to pass in arguments, rbind is a better fit. Again, for DOM events, uh, rbind is a better fit. The, the distinction between y.bind and y.rbind is that y.bind will take all of the arguments that you pass it and it'll prepend the list of arguments into your function with all of that extra stuff. And this is, this is actually coming into uh, ECMAScript 5, now has bind in, uh, I think it's on the function prototype, and that's the way they modeled it. We may not agree with it, but that's the way they modeled it, and so that's what uh, bind does. But we actually think that having the, the parameters, the extra parameters added to the end makes a little more sense, especially in the case of DOM events where you kind of want that first argument to be your event object, right? Consistently, you want your API to say, the first thing I get is that event object. I may or may not get a bunch of other junk, but I can count on that event object being the first parameter. And so that's what our bind does. It just says, add my stuff to the end versus the beginning. So our bind in this case is also kind of boiled into the API so that you can pass in the event name, the function handler, override context, and any number of arguments that you want to also go into the signature of your event handler. Now, incidentally, if you don't need to override the context, because this is, you know, we're now to the fourth and fifth and sixth parameters. If you don't want to override the, the context, you can just pass null for that. <clears throat> okay, so we've gotten taken care of those first two. Let's talk about detaching events. So this is the, the basic pattern for detaching events. This is present in YUI2, slightly different API because your Yahoo Util event dot, uh, I think, detach listener. So shortening that to detach and passing in the signature of the subscription. But that's not terribly convenient because you end up having to duplicate the exact uh, signature of that subscription in the detach phase. And really, what a nuisance. I mean, you have a subscription. So now the, the subscribers, the on method actually returns what's called a detach handle, and all you have to do is call detach on that thing, and it's done, and it's gone, right? So that is a really short way of doing things that way. Another way that we made possible to do uh, is to give your subscriptions a name. So you can say, I'm subscribing to my, uh, my button, my button's click event to do something. So you notice this is a pipe. Um, we were already using colon for event bubbling, so we settled on pipe. And you can just detach the name that you've given that subscription. You don't have to worry about the rest of the signature because it, it understands it by name. So the extension of this is that that's not just a name, it's actually a category. So you can add many, many, many subscriptions into that same category, and you can detach them all in one glob. This is really handy for creating widgets or something that have a lot of internal events that are going on that uh, you might have a lot of internal subscribers to to manage state. You just create all of your event subscriptions, uh, is do all of your event subscriptions under one category, and if there is a destructor or there is a destroy process in the lifecycle for this thing, you just call detach with that name passing in the star, everything is gone. So we like that one. Okay, on to the greatness. Um, 
Satyan is actually going to talk a lot about, a lot more about the after moments and the attributes stuff. Uh, but let me just give you a quick run through here. So we have an instance that fires this event, and we have our on listeners, and then uh, if it's not prevented, it goes on to the default function. But maybe what you care about is what happens after the fact, right? How many times you've wished that I could subscribe to something on the DOM where I don't, I don't need to stop it. I just need to know what it's like afterwards. So we can't do that for you for the DOM, but we can do that for you for custom events. So we now have an, a, a, a parallel method called after, which allows you to subscribe to that moment that happens just after the default function happens, but before any further app logic that, uh, that may occur after that event was fired. So inside of your code, you have, inside of the implementation code, you have, or, yeah, you have some code, and then this event gets fired, and then some more code. The after subscribers will execute before the rest of that code happens. Right? But after any state changes that may have happened inside of that default function. This is really relevant to the, uh, to the managed attributes portion of base. And again, Satyan, in case I haven't mentioned enough by now, we'll be talking about that. Um, but after moments are really relevant for managed attributes because you might be holding on to a value attribute or something. And you internally don't need to care about it's going to be set. You care that it changed. So if someone prevents that, the after subscribers aren't going to fire. Only if you've got through the default function are the after subscribers going to fire. Does that make sense? I'll say that again. So we have the on subscribers, the default function, and the after subscribers. The on subscribers give you the capacity to, to, to say, don't execute the default behavior. If the default behavior executes, then there has been a change, and the after subscribers are notified that there has been a change. If the default behavior is prevented, there hasn't been a change, and so the after subscribers are not notified because there wasn't, there wasn't a change to notify them of. So the after moments represent a good point to hook in to apply side effects as a result of state changes. So again, <clears throat> the on subscribers are where you want to subscribe if you want to see things before they're changed. The changes to the state happen in the default function, and the after subscribers get a view of the world after that state has been changed. And like I said, we, we like hooks. So now let's get into the, uh, the new DOM events. This is... I'm personally pretty excited about this because uh, of the way it ends up at the end of the day, which we'll see in just a couple of slides here. So the, this is the basic pattern right now for how to add a, a new special event into the event subsystem. So I have a, a chained equals here for the sake of space, but you'll notice that there's an environment that contains an event subsystem, and you can plug in your event in there. But you also want to identify that this is a DOM node event, or this is, a, this is a DOM event, or it can be treated like a DOM event. So that means that if you have a node in hand, you can subscribe to this event on that node. So you just set up your on handler, and this is what gets called in lieu of the, the default event subsystem for its on behavior. And that's where the magic happens. So uh, Eric actually showed this on the slide. Not sure how many of you saw it, but I wrote this, uh, this special event called Konami. Um, maybe some of you are familiar with the, what the Konami event, or the Konami code is, hopefully. So for those of you that aren't aware, this is a cheat code that Konami introduced into a lot of its video games, uh, whereby you can just up, up, down, down, left, right, left, right, BA, and it'll send you into God mode or something, right? So that got adopted elsewhere, and it kind of became this, this cute little meme. And, or, cult following or whatever. So <laughs> this was actually fairly easy to do. Let's just set up a Konami event by saying here are the, here are the key codes that are relevant. And then inside of my on subscriber, 
I'm going to set up the necessary DOM events under the hood for the node that was passed into me, and then do all of the checking that's necessary, and then check the progress, and then once the, the progress is, uh, has gotten there, then fire my, my special internal event. And that means that this is how you use events that you add into the YUI subsystem, right? So those are the above and beyond points that I wanted to talk about. The, of course, you can use the added, the added DOM events for uh, more practical things, perhaps. You know, it's always fun to have fun. But uh, I think uh, um, Isaac is actually going to talk a little bit about uh, creating another DOM event for his use in autocomplete. Um, I've written some uh, another event for subscribing to a text input where you get a notification after there's been a, a pause um, in, in typing, which was based on some work done by the man back there, Ryan Grove. Um, so the, the big takeaway here from my talk is that the custom event system in YUI 3 is bigger and better and badasser than, uh, than just your basic DOM. It has all of these great features in it. And I want you to take this and rethink about how you're going to use events and <clears throat> how you're going to build your apps and really leverage the power of an event-driven architecture, an event-driven infrastructure, so that the code that you write goes with the grain of the system that you're actually building, taking that DOM event system, building up your app subsystem on top of that, and all of it works the same and has just consistent code throughout and consistent behavior. So here's some image credits for the things that I added, but that's what I have for today. So any questions? We've explained the distinction a little better between uh, setting up bubbles and specifying broadcast. So um, when you configure an event to bubble, you need to specify the chain of that bubble path. And that chain can consist of any event target. So you can say, I, as an event target, I'm going to bubble my events to this other event target to this other event target. <laughs> The fact that that other event target has a responsibility as a manager class is sort of an aside. It isn't a requirement necessarily. It's just saying, I will also broadcast your events, and I will also broadcast your events. But doing the add target manually uh, is just closer to, the, closer to the metal. It allows you to configure specifically where those events are also going to be fired from. Broadcast, on the other hand, is a simpler mechanism that says, I just want the Y instance, that I, the YUI instance that I'm in, to also broadcast my events, and potentially the Y.global to also broadcast those events. It doesn't add the, the configurability of saying, here is the path I want it to take before it gets up to the Y instance, for example. Does that answer your question? You had a question? Right. So the y dot global, um, the way that y dot global is built is that it doesn't give, doesn't give YUI instance A and YUI instance B introspection into the code that's executing into in, from one instance to the to the next. It doesn't actually give any access to that. But as an event target, it's useful as a relay of messaging to say something's going on over here that you might be interested in. You can, you're free to actually pass objects and things in your firing from one instance to the other if you need to transfer data, per se. But um, there might be other ways to, to skin that cat. Does that answer your question? OK, so the question is, is there a way to have the default function or the default behavior for an event fire either before or in parallel to its subscribers? Okay. Uh, the answer to that is no. The, the event system is based on the DOM, and it patterns the DOM, but we provide you the after moment specifically for that use case. So if you publish an event that has a default function 
that means that it is possible for uh, implementers to subscribe to that event's on moment. If you don't want it to be preventable, you can configure it not to be preventable, but those subscribers will be executed before the default function happens. You can recommend that, <clears throat> that people subscribe to the after moment if it's really more pertinent to do so, in which case you don't have those unsubscribers slowing down the execution of your default function. But no, you, the unsubscribers, it's the contract of the unsubscribers that they have the capacity to, to interject into that workflow. Um, so the question is, um, <clears throat> what happens if you subscribe to the click event or a, any DOM event uh, using after? So button.after click or something like that. And the answer is that it's, it's uh, functionally equivalent to on. It still happens, but um, it, yeah, so if you have a key down, for example, that character is going to show up after your after event. Okay, well, I'm going to be hanging out over here at the side for a few minutes. Um, thanks, everyone, for showing up. Hope uh, everyone has a better understanding.